welcome everyone. I see we have some things going on in chat. Okay, Lisa. Suey like chop suey. Thank you. We got it. Thank you very much. So the, we don't say the Z. I got it. Welcome everyone. I'll remember that. Suey. Good. Okay. It's uh, it's about tax to the max. And we have an interesting array of subjects uh, this week. Um, at least they were interesting to me. That's how we got in the program. Here's the disclaimer. And what's really important is I, I acknowledge the value of my subscription to tax notes today. And I recommend that. Uh, it's, in my opinion, it is the preeminent source of current information for tax professionals coming out of Washington, DC. It's all tax analysts does. It, unlike other services it, that are a part of large corporations, multinational corporations, tax analysts is devoted to the, uh, the help, helping professionals understand the uh, Internal Revenue Code, IRS rulings. Uh, they have uh, litigated issues to get information for practitioners that we seem to be locked up in Washington over the years. The fact that we can get access to private letter rulings is a result of litigation by tax analysts. So I recommend you give them a try. They've got a 30 day free um, look. It might be worth a try, especially here in the middle of tax season when you need answers in a hurry. Now, let's start with a South Carolina item. The Department of Revenue says homeowners should check for credits. And I wasn't aware of all these credits, so I thought uh, we just kind of maybe review those. And then the construction of an eco-friendly home showcasing uh, eco-friendly uh, construction methods turns out to be a for-profit activity. Now, a lot of taxpayers claiming for-profit activities so they can claim losses end up in losses. They, they, don't, they don't win with the IRS. These taxpayers claim losses and they win, they get to claim those losses because the activity was judged to be for profit. And that's our special topic this week. We'll spend some time with it when we get there. And then I, this, this headline, the headline was, tell us a story. What? <laughs> in, in a tax review? Yeah. Yeah, the IRS is, wants everyone who wants a an activity to be judged an active trade or business, even though it has no cash receipts, to tell them a story about why there are no cash receipts and why this really is an active business. And then I know you're all gonna be excited to know that the IRS has opened an office focused on customer service. The problem is you're not the customer, neither am I. The taxpayer is the customer and we're gonna have, to work that out, we, we still have the supposedly the traditional avenues of seeking assistance for practitioners. And then the IRS wants us to comment on a partnership settlement waiver. You won't believe all the facts that go with that. And finally, we have a new child tax credit form. It's not that the form is new, it is that the worksheets are new and they're all in the worksheets. There, there are no separate worksheets now. Everything is, is in the instructions for the Schedule 8812. Well, if there are questions today, please post them in the chat. I monitor the chat. I can, it pops up at the top of my screen and I will know there's a question to be answered. We can, you, we can open your mic so that you can, we can talk about it. I have no problem with that. We have plenty of time. And I want, I want, us to, I want this to develop into a very friendly, very open conversation about developments in taxation where questions can be asked and answered in real time. South Carolina income tax for individuals. Here is a list of the credits for which you might be eligible. You may have a certified historic residential structure that you're living in. You may have paid insurance premiums higher than the standard, in which case you get a tax credit against your, your South Carolina income tax. You get a tax credit if you have an energy efficient manufactured home, that would be 
we, we think of a, of a house trailer, but manufactured homes are well beyond that these days. And then if you have invested in geothermal machinery and equipment, there is a credit there as well. All of these credits are non-refundable, which means they will, they will decrease your South Carolina income tax liability, but they will not generate a refund. They're credits against a liability, but they will not generate a refund after the liability has been, has been wiped out. Today's special topic, Jessica Wallers, TC Memo 2022-17, deals with Treasury Regulation 1.83-2, an activity not engaged in for profit. What's the definition? The term activity not engaged in for profit means any activity other than one with respect to which deductions are allowable under 162 or 212. There are nine factors. The nine factors are in the regulations. They're not in the code. What's in the code is code section 162, trade or business expenses, all the ordinary and necessary expenses paid or incurred during the taxable year in carrying on a trade or business. I have an accounting practice. My subscription to tax analysts is ordinary and it's necessary. My subscription to the uh, artwork of the month from the Metropolitan Museum of Art is neither ordinary for a tax practice nor is it necessary to conduct our business. So there would be no allowable deduction for a subscription to a service that had nothing to do with my business. Now code section 212 is close, but not exactly like 162. 162 is, is deductions in connection with a trade or a business. Code section 212 is deductions in connection with the production or collection of income. And there are two parts to that, the production or collection of income or the management, conservation, or maintenance of property held for the production of income. We are a rental activity is a section 212 activity. An investment activity is a section 212 activity, but a store or a manufacturing plant or a mine, those are code section 162 activities. But all are subject to the nine factors. When do the nine factors come into play? The nine factors come into play when, a, when an insurance agent or an accountant or a lawyer or a doctor or a, an executive has a business other than their principal income earning activity. Now, the nine factors can be applied to an individual. The nine factors can be applied to a partnership. They can be applied to a corporation. They can be applied to an S corporation. A non-exclusive list of objective factors to be considered in deciding whether an activity is engaged in for profit. The Jones Remodeling Corporation has a drag race operation. It's not in a separate corporation, but young Jones, Jones Jr., drives a, a, a drag racer and they make they bought a couple of engines for it because they blow an engine now and then and, and they're spending 20 or thirty thousand dollars a year and every now and then they win a five hundred dollar prize in a race but their primary business is remodeling homes so that that factor that that racing car is not related to their trade or business and is sure to attract the attention of the Internal Revenue Service if it is a matter sufficiently substantial. We tax people deal with substantiality, not materiality, but substantiality. Is an item substantial when taken in, in the context of the taxpayer total income and the taxpayer's tax obligation? Sometimes it's wrong, but it's not substantial and it just isn't worth screwing with. And so not only would I pass it, but an IRS agent would get in trouble for messing with it in an audit. So the judge here, tax court judge Wells, 
quotes these two paragraphs from Allen versus Commissioner back in 1979. So this definition, a non-exclusive list of objective factors, this has all been around for a long time. But every year, every year, we'll have a client that wants to test that. We have an insurance agent that grew up on a farm and now has a farm. We have a, we have a lawyer that grew up in a, in a, on a cattle ranch and now the lawyer has a cattle ranch. Are they engaged in these and they lose money year after year after year? Are they engaged in these for profit? Could they be? Is there anyone, anything in these factors that would mitigate in their favor? Well, let's talk about the nine factors. The manner in which the taxpayer carries on the activity. Is it conducted as a business? Is there a business plan? Do they even have a separate bank account? Do they do a periodic income statement? Do they, can the taxpayer tell you at any given time uh, how much money is invested in the activity, what's going on in the activity? So is there a business plan? Do they keep books? Do they have a separate bank account? Do they have a taxpayer identification number for that other activity? You know, by the way, the, now remember these factors are non-exclusive and it isn't a matter of five versus four. You can fail one factor and fail the test. The nine factors are non-exclusive factors to be considered in the totality of the taxpayer's relationship to the activity. Is the taxpayer an expert? My lawyer that grew up on a cattle ranch is an expert on raising cattle. And he started out with a, with a herd of 20 cows and they had calves and he kept, the, he kept the heifers and he sold off the bull calves. Now he has 40 cows. 40, 40 female cows that can get pregnant and have, have calves. So the value of his herd has increased. That's, a, that's, a, that's going to be a factor that comes up here in a minute. But the, the taxpayer, the lawyer, is an expert in cattle ranching. So that would, that would mitigate in his favor the time and effort expended by the taxpayer. This lawyer is out on that cattle ranch every weekend. He practices law in the, in the town for five days a week and he's out there on the cattle ranch two days a week and he's out there at, at branding time and he's so here you've got the time and effort expended but so well you know I, I have a daughter that likes horses and so we have a horse and uh so we're in the business of of breeding horses well, that would be wonderful except the the papers on this horse who's a, a male horse, have a G in parentheses after his registration, which means he's a gelding. Uh, you're not going to breed horses with a gelding. And so I actually had a, a client that tried to tell me that story and wanted me to tell that story to the IRS. We didn't do that. Time and effort, expectation assets used in the activity might appreciate. Um, so the, the taxpayer that had the horse, he didn't spend any time on the horse. It wasn't a matter of whether the horse was any good for breeding or not. The horse was, to, was handed over to a trainer. There was no time and effort. They just wrote checks every month for the expenses. That doesn't make them deductible. The success of the taxpayer. So you've got an automobile dealer making half a million dollars a year. Now, all of a sudden, the automobile dealer is interested in some development of a, of a, of a patentable project. And, uh, but it doesn't work, and it doesn't work year after year. Well, this person's a successful automobile dealer, and they've never carried on any other business, but they're sure not successful in the, in the business of, of uh, scientific development, and that factor would probably mitigate against them. Number six, the history of income or loss with respect to the activity. The activity has never made a profit. If it's never made a profit, what kind of moron continues to pour money into it and expects to get the tax benefit of the losses? The Internal Revenue Code says that you can claim the, the deduction for expenses in connection with a trade or business. And these regulations say that if it's a real trade or business, you will meet these nine factors favorably. If there are no profits, how can it be a trade or business? 
if the losses simply go against the income of the taxpayer from another activity, from practicing law or from an automobile dealer or, or from some other activity. And then there is the elements of per, element of personal pleasure. In this horse, this gelding, the taxpayer's daughter rode this horse in shows. There was a lot of personal pleasure associated with that. Now, I grew up on a farm. I have always wanted a farm. I was always too busy doing other things. But if I had a farm, there would be a lot of personal pleasure in planting the garden and tending the, the vegetables and, and tending maybe a cow or two and maybe some chickens and, and a pig. And, and that, I would have fun doing that. I wouldn't necessarily be looking to make any money, but should I be able to deduct the losses associated with my farm that never intends to make a profit? Well, there you have the nine factors. I may have talked longer about one than the other, and frequently you'll, the judge will go through the nine, as Judge Wells did here, and he'll say, so this factor favors the taxpayer, or this factor favors the IRS, or this factor is neutral, and get to the end and count factors. And so a majority of the factors favors the taxpayer, therefore the taxpayer wins. But occasionally, even though the majority of factors favors the taxpayer, the, the overwhelming the, the overwhelming circumstances mitigate against the taxpayer claiming a deduction. The, 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 the factors that favor the taxpayer are only incidental. And the factor that doesn't favor the taxpayer is huge. And so we can't just count factors to make this thing work. I share this with you because we're in the middle of tax season and you're going to need this possibly before tax season is over because you're gonna have a client that wants to deduct the expenses of an activity that doesn't meet the nine factor test. Let's shift gears. Let's consider the conditions required for a tax-free corporate spinoff. We're still talking about business, but this is the opposite direction. To qualify as a tax-free spinoff, both the distributing and the controlled corporation must show that they've been engaged in a trade or business active for at least five years. This comes about when a corporation may have started a business and that business grows and the shareholders would like to have, they'd like to own two businesses instead of one. They may want to keep one and sell the other. So these spinoff rules come up fairly frequently. They can come up in connection with a family business where the family, the family business has two stores. My favorite illustration of this was a client I had for years. They had two pharmacies. And the parents, when the father died, the mother decided to retire. And the two brothers who had managed the different pharmacies no longer wanted to be have their pharmacies pooled in a pot. So we split off one pharmacy from the old corporation. We had an old corporation and a new corporation. And one brother owned one, the other brother owned the other. But we had to show that both of these stores had been, had been actively engaged in a trade or business by themselves. But has the world changed? Is it, do we now have spinoffs of companies that are engaged in research and have never had a dollar of income? There are folks who say that should be so. So can you have an active business with no income? The IRS says, well, yes, but tell us a story. Tell us why you think you have an active business with no income. And we're going to continue to make a rule by rule determination on whether you can qualify as an active trader business without any income having been collected. This comes in the middle of the IRS reconsidering every aspect of the proposed regulations on corporate split up spin offs and split offs issued back in 2007 for the first time modified and updated in 2016, but still only proposed. And the IRS, and this is a quote, 
really engaged in a complete retake of all of this. And this is a quote from the IRS Associate Chief Counsel Corporate. If your, if your job involves corporate planning, if instead of being in public practice, you are an, an accounting executive in a public company, you may need to know about the rules regarding split-offs, spin-offs, in order to have an intelligent conversation with your outside CPA firm. The IRS has opened a taxpayer experience office, and I found this, uh, <laughs> I found this, this picture that I thought was appropriate. Can you figure out what the frame is? We'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll accept, uh, if you have to chat, tell me, tell me what that frame is that frames the uh, visage of the IRS employee who's certain of what she's doing answering the phone. Now, that this is not a sexist deal at all. It, it, this is gonna man, I just couldn't find a picture of a man. They're gonna focus on all aspects of taxpayer transactions with the IRS across service, compliance, and other program areas. They're gonna coordinate with all IRS business units and the taxpayer advocate service. So we might be going up through the taxpayer advocate service and our client would join this effort by clocking into the taxpayer experience office. I'm not a taxpayer in this case. I'm a representative. So I need to equip my client to contact the taxpayer experience office. This is led by chief taxpayer experience officer, which is a new position, Ken Corbin. I see we have a chat. Let's, let's open the chat. <laughs> okay, Paul, you're right. That is the lid to a toilet. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Next case. Good, good job, Paul. Okay, let's <laughs> let's get we're here. Now the IRS is seeking comments on this waiver form. If you have a client that is a partner in a large partnership, more than 10 partners under audit, that's a TEFRA partnership, your client can waive their right to participate in all of the conferences with the IRS regarding their audit results and the audit and the conduct of the audit. They would do that with a form 13751. I found the form and I have a picture of the form coming up on the next slide. And the IRS is requesting comments on the form. The title is Waiver of Right to Consistent Agreement of Partnership Items and Partnership Level Determinations as to Penalties, Additions to Tax, and Additional Amounts. In other words, you don't have to, you're going to deal with me separately. I'm going to deal with you separate. I don't want to be part of the global settlement with the partnership. I'll take my chances. You go ahead and do whatever you're going to do with the partnership and the other partners. So that you use that to waive your right to request settlement terms for partnership items. And the IRS wants comments by May 6th. Well, here's the form. I found it on the IRS website, not the internet, not Google, the IRS website. I call your attention to the far left side of your screen, form 13751 and the date. October 2005. Are you kidding me? Wait a second. What is this form about? I found the instructions for it. The undersigned taxpayer in accordance with Rev Internal Revenue Section 6224B, well, well, wait, wait, waives the right to request settlement, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. Well, wait. Code Section 6224 was repealed by the Bipartisan Budget Act of 2015, but the regulations continue to be available. The citation is 301.6224A-1 through C3. So there's a lot of information, the information you need to opt out of the universal settlement of a partnership audit 
is contained in these regulations, which have survived the repeal of the code section to which they relate. Now that's not uncommon, it happens. And therefore, when we are engaged in a search like this, we need to be aware of the possibility that even though a code section has been repealed, there may be regulations which have not been repealed, have not been removed, that will give us the guidance that we need to follow the law and give our clients good advice. Tax to the max wants to, wants to, to do a good job of educating about taxes. And it isn't all about this case or that case or that ruling. It can be about a jurisdiction. It can be about the, the, uh, the, an opinion that is consistently rendered by one judge that is different from another judge in a different district. It can, it can be about maybe sometimes taking your chances in audit. There's nothing wrong with that. You're your client's advocate. Now, you can't do anything dishonest. You have to follow the law. But if your interpretation of the statute is honest and you strongly believe in the, con in the advice you're giving your client, you can represent your client right or you can represent your client in connection with a lawyer. You got to be a lawyer. You can help the lawyer take it all the way up to the Supreme Court. You may be wrong, but you were, you were sincere. <laughs> you, were, you were wrong, but you were honest. Tax, the IRS has replaced the child tax credit form. That's somewhat misleading. It's not that they replaced the form. They have included all of the spreadsheets in the instructions. Fact sheet 2022-17 gives you all the information you need here. Be sure to use the new form together with its instructions for calculating the child tax credit and reporting advanced child tax credit payments. I'm working on a return right now for a family member who didn't file a tax return, never mind why, for 2020. And they so they're just right in the middle of the IRS not knowing whether what, 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 what's going on. And so they didn't get the child, the advanced child tax credit. Now we're gonna to have to claim it with the 2021 return. This form is the single source for figuring and reporting the child tax credit and credits for other dependents. And all the applicable worksheets are in the instructions. Well, can we continue to meet for lunch? It's good to see everyone. Every week, Thursday at noon, this Zoom call, it's going to feature current information about developments in administration, cases, rulings, South Carolina state tax law. We will have guest experts from time to time about which you express a special interest. And on that subject, if I have expressions of special interest from you, the loyal supporters of this program, we will respond to that expression of need and provide material commentary on your special interest. Do you have a question? Maybe we can put the question up and someone in the group can help. Questions about topics in my opening presentation can be answered in real time today. Here's the, uh, here's the email address at the bottom of this slide. There's the phone call, phone number. The phone, phone works, but it's not the very best uh, medium for asking a complicated text text question that usually that works best on an email but i'm always glad to get them and i'll i'll respond within 24 hours thank you again for your support until next time that's it for tax to the max